Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Thankful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, ask an interest in your prayers as I stand before you this morning. And I hope that you've been praying for the service. Um, hope that you've come expecting to meet the Lord. Hope that you have some expectation of edification and instruction and confirmation of your studies and your meditation throughout the week. Uh, if you've not come expecting anything, you may not take anything out of what I have to say. Uh, we're getting a late start, it seems, this morning. Um, but nonetheless, I hope if if I go if I do go over the time, I hope that you'll uh, cast a mantle of charity over my lengthiness. But I, I have a subject on my mind, and it's a question: Is his name Jesus or Yeshua? I'm hearing this all the time. Yeshua, Yeshua. And if you call Him Jesus, they say, you're actually calling upon Zeus, the Greek god Zeus. I'm not buying. I'm not buying this. This is akin, well this has its, its uh, origins in the Hebrew Roots Movement. And uh, it's akin to the Greek game. You know, like the Greek game goes like this. Anybody can pick up a concordance and say, well, the King James says that the word is uh, voice, but the Greek word is phone. And, wow, aren't you impressed by that? And it's kind of like the same kind of thing. This movement is less than 50 years old, but it's, it's taking hold, and it demands that we as Christians be Torah keepers. Now, Torah is the book of Moses, and we understand it as the five, first five books of the law or the book of Moses. The, the Jews knew nothing about five books of the law, but they knew the book of Moses. We have it divided. They say that we have to be Torah keepers and that we have to call, uh, instead of calling Him Jesus, we have to call Him Yeshua. Well, I have a, I have a lot of problems with that. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I have no problem uh, studying out Hebrew roots. Uh, we need to have a good working knowledge and understanding of what we're reading about in the New, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. In our Western culture, we have an idea, we make a lot of assumptions about when we read something, and even in the New Testament, we assume when it talks about a wedding. In a Jewish wedding, it's not about here comes the bride like we uh, emphasize here in our culture. It's about here comes the groom. So there are a lot of things about the Old Testament uh, that we. it's good that we have a working knowledge of them, that we have an understanding of, of Hebrew roots, uh, but it does, that does not mean that we are to latch upon the law and live by the law. Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And John says in John chapter 1, for uh, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So there, there's always this idea, and the Apostle Paul uh, uh, wrote to the Galatian church that was being they were they were being trying to be hijacked to take them out from under the grace of God back into the, the weak and beggarly elements of the law and, and to worship under the law service. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. I've got several scriptures laid out that I can show that we're not to go that direction. Um, we have to have an understanding that the New Testament was written in Greek. At the time that, that Jesus Christ was walking upon the face of the earth, the universal 
language and the business language of the time was Greek. Now, Jesus spoke Aramaic, and and, uh, and, they, and there's some Hebrew in there too. Now, I, I don't have time to go in the depth of all this, but suffice it to say that our New Testament was written in Greek, and it was written in Greek for a purpose. Um, we, we have people that argue, well, we shouldn't call... Uh, uh, we shouldn't call our Savior Jesus. We should call Him Yeshua because there was no J in the English language. Uh, now, it would take a, I'm not going to labor, take a lot of time laboring on that, but I want to give you kind, some kind of understanding. There's, there's some people that are claiming that the King James had been revised four times. Now, there's a difference between a revision and a correction. Uh, a, re- a revision would change words, would add words, would subtract words, and would change words. None of that happened. The King James is based off of the Texas Receptus, which is the received text that has over 5,000 manuscripts that support it, versus all the new Bibles that are based on the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, which have just a few over 50 manuscripts that support it. And by, by the way, the Vaticanus, that tells you that's from the Vatican. All new Bibles are basically Catholic Bibles. Now, I'm not saying that to be mean or ugly, but I'm just telling you that's, those are facts. But you have to understand, uh, back in 1450, Johann Gutenberg invented, uh, invented what we know as the printing press. Now, I want you to think for just a minute, when the first, when the first Bible was actually printed, they were pr- printed on... Uh, animal skins. And then I think at the first two or so, then after that, uh, China had come out with the modern type of paper that we have today. And of course, it's been refined over the years. But I want you to consider the fact that in the King James Bible, there's 3,116,480 letters. And on that printing press, those letters or those block letters had to be laid upside down and reverse one page at a time. And uh, can you imagine that this was done flawlessly uh, or, or without any type of spelling errors or printing errors? I, well, I will freely admit that there were some printing errors in this. So there's 3,116,480 letters. There's 783,137 words. 31,102 verses, 1,189 chapters, and 66 books by 40 authors over a span of 1,500 years. But I want you to see the task of actually printing these Bibles one at a time. They would lay these, these block letters out, reverse. It's sort of like you had to have the mirror image so when it comes out and you see it on the book that you can read it properly. So... There were mistakes that were made in printing. Uh, I need you need to keep that in mind. Now, another thing that we need to understand is that modern English did not begin to be spoken until about 1500. And by the way, we are speaking modern English. The King James was written in modern English. If you're thinking it was Middle English or Old English, I want you. What I want you to do is get on YouTube and Google uh, Middle English and listen to it. You will not understand anything that they are saying. I, I Trust me, that's the truth. And you get on there and you Google Old English, it's even worse. And now, Middle English, you might pick up an I or, you or something, but you're not going to get very much. But Modern English was born about 1500. Now, the vocabulary of Modern English was settled around the early 1600s or right around the time of the writing of King James. But was what... But what, what was not settled was the spelling of words. Okay, another thing, and then there had later on, there had to be some correction in the spelling of the words. But remember, there were no additions, there were no deletions, there, there were no replacements, but there were corrections in, there were in the printing, in the printing errors, and there were corrections in the spelling. And another thing that you need to take into consideration is the first King James was printed in Gothic text. Has anybody ever seen? Now, what we read is Roman text. What we have in our, 
in most of our language today is written, the type set is Roman text. If you've never seen Gothic text, the, the J looks like an I, the, the V looks like a U, the S looks like an F. Okay, uh, I don't, I'm not going to take a lot of time to go in there, but the text type was changed. And that no more, that doesn't change uh, the words in the book, it just changed the text type. That's just like if you're doing a, a Microsoft Word document and you choose uh, uh, whatever, Baltic 14, or you choose Helvetia or whatever, you're not changing the substance, you're just changing the text. And that's one of the things, originally they used the Gothic text because they believed that it was more eloquent. And I agree that it is more eloquent, but they later changed it to the Roman text. Now, so I go through all that to say that it's a big to do uh, uh, about nothing to say that we need to call him Jesus by his Hebrew name. The scripture was written in Greek. Now, uh, there's one text, I've got some scriptures laid out, and I want to read them. And I want to give you an idea that there was a change that took place. There was a time of reformation when Jesus came on the scene. You've heard me talk about it before. Uh, over in Matthew chapter 21, we read this text. And the Lord was speaking to the Jews, or to the Hebrews. He says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and giving to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, that was a, a very plain declaration that the kingdom of God would be taken from the Hebrews and given to the Gentile nations. That's you and I. So had the Lord wanted uh, the, the Christians to be steeped in Hebrew uh, practice, now, like I say, there's nothing wrong with understanding Hebrew roots so that we can get a good understanding of what we're reading about. We're talking about not only was there a, 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 was it a time of reformation that the law service would diminish and fade away, but grace would be established. There was a change in the order of service. You see, those in the Hebrew Roots Movement today say that we need to be Torah keepers. But I'm going to tell you two things that, that whereby they cannot keep the Torah. The number one is the animal sacrifices. Well, they've got an excuse for that. Not going to take the time to go into it. The second thing is, if anybody that, that claims to be a Torah keeper takes a Nazarite vow, there is no way that he can ever get out from under that vow. Because according to the Torah, or according to the, scripture, uh, the Scriptures, he had to go to that, to that tabernacle or the altar, and his hair had to be offered on that altar in the, in the, in the fire. And, there, and that's the only way that he could be released from his vow. So, and there's other things. But you see, we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Aren't you glad that we're, that we're under grace and we're not under all the, the stringent requirements of the law of Moses? The 613 different ordinances. And if you fell in one, you fell in all of them. We're not called. We're not called to go back and, and live according to our Hebrew roots. And by the way, you know who a true Jew is anyway? All those things in the Old Testament served as types and shadows of the true one which is to come. All those animal sacrifices typified the one true sacrifice which was to come. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't, we're not to live according to the law. We live according to grace. Unless anything, anything that's in the law that, that we need to be observing is going to be brought forward in the New Testament and we'll be told about it. Now there's a couple of things that I can think about. One is the Ten Commandments. The royal law of love. That's, that's what the Lord talks about. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. The Lord took those Ten Commandments and brought them down to two. That's brought forward. That's the moral law. We're, it's still incumbent upon us to live moral lives. Okay, that ne That's not going to change. Then another thing is, is where the Apostle Paul talks about the, the new moon, the trumpets, uh, and the atonement, uh, which are shadows of things which are to come. And that's in the New Testament. And there are some other things. Uh, the, 
the, the doctrine of the resurrection is brought forward. The doctrine of the judgment is brought forward in the New Testament. But all the rest of those things, we're not to live by the law. Um, we live under grace. Now, on the strength of that one text alone, that the kingdom of God would be taken from the, from the Hebrews and given to the Gentiles, the Hebrew roots thing kind of falls to the ground. Uh, like I say, then again, it's just less than 50 years old, and it's, it's nothing more than another version of the Greek game where some anybody can take a concordance and say, oh, look, the, the, you can look at the word Jehovah and what its underlying Hebrew name is, Elohim, or whatever. You can play that, and you can really impress people with it. I hear people doing it on Facebook all the time. And quite frankly, I thought it was time that I, I needed to, to say something about it. But it's important. The name of Jesus Christ is important. Remember what the angel said to, to Mary? Uh, Thou shalt call His name Yeshua? No! Thou shalt call His name Jesus. And that name means Savior. He is Jesus Christ is the Savior anointed for the remission of sins. Thou shalt call His name Jesus. Now I know some people say, well, you know, we got to live under the law because Jesus said, uh, Think not I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy but fulfill. I say yea and amen. The Lord came. Uh, he didn't come to destroy the law but to fulfill it. And He has fulfilled it. And now there are some certain aspects that He has to fulfill, but nowhere are we told that we have to fulfill uh, the law for righteousness. Remember, I've already quoted you that Paul said that Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. No, we don't have to. Now there was a... I told you about a change. Now we, we think about the Reformation... Almost automatically, everyone's mind runs to Luther and Calvin and the Protestant Reformation. Well, first of all, I'll tell you that we're, we as Old Baptists are not Protestants. We did not come out of that. We did not come out of that movement of coming out of the Catholic Church. We never were in the Catholic Church. Now, then again, I'm not trying to be ugly. This is, histo this is history. Uh, anybody can look it up. But... There was a reformation that's spoken of in the book of Hebrews. A time of reformation. When the one ultimate sacrifice, uh, when the, the God manifests in the flesh, His name being Jesus of Nazareth, went to the, the cross of Calvary, suffered, bled, and died in the room instead of His people. Okay? There was a change. Uh, uh, the grace was being established. And the law faded away. You can read that in the book of Hebrews. That the law faded away. But, but there was a necessity of a change. And I told you there was a change in the order of service. From law to grace. And there was also a change in the priesthood. From the Levitical priesthood to, the, to, to the, uh, uh, that which is after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, and he says in, in Hebrews chapter 7, he says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, and by the way, he tells, goes on to tell us that what we have is something better. Uh, when we talk about law, I don't have time to go into the depth of it. But when you read the word law, just don't assume the 1613 ordinances of the ceremonial law. Don't assume the Ten Commandments. Don't assume the laws of nature. Don't, don't assume uh, the law of sin and death. Don't, don't assume anything because there's what I've just pointed out to you is there's more than one law. When you read the word law, by the way, the law is a principle of instruction. When you read the word law, you need to rightly divide and discern what law it's talking about. In the New Testament it says, uh, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. So there's more than one law. But anyway, there was a necessity of the change. And in Hebrews 9, when he was talking about all those motions that they went through in the Old Testament of offering the animal sacrifices and of the cleansing of the altar and, and the Day of Atonement, all of those things, 
He says uh, they were uh, in Hebrews 9 verse 10 says which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of reformation. You see, it was imposed upon the Jews or the Hebrews until the time of Reformation. And Jesus Christ is the true Reformer. Uh, he, re- he reformed uh, the Kingdom of God. Remember, the Kingdom of God was what? Taken from the, from the Hebrews and given to the Gentiles. That's the Reformation that's under consideration. That is that 40 year period from eighty thirty to eighty seventy, when. The, uh, the Scripture testifies that the Gospel that Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1.6 and in 1.23 that the Gospel had gone into all the world and had been preached to every creature. So the foundation of grace was laid. And then, the, then later on we read about some people were haggling over whether or not the new converts over there in Romans chapter 14 should keep the feast days. Right? Um, but you, what you see is that grace was established and the law was suffered to fade away. No more ceremonial sacrifices. It's impossible for anyone that, that uh, pretends to be a Torah keeper, it's impossible for them to keep it completely. And I, as I've told you already, the, the Scripture says if you're guilty, if guilty in one point, you're guilty of all of it. You're guilty of not... And you can't do animal sacrifices. And you cannot terminate an Azerite vow. Those are are two that just stand out in my mind. So we're not here to try to keep... If we could keep the Torah, if we could keep the law, why did Jesus ever come to begin with? He came because we could not. The The law was not weak. We were weak. Finding fault with them, the Scripture says. Not with it, but with them. God made this change. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, he says, speaking of Jesus, but now He hath obtained a more excellent ministry as contrasted to the Old Testament and the things contained in the law of Moses, but now He hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of what? A better covenant. Okay? Which is established upon better promises. Now, do you want a, a, a worse covenant, covenant or do you want a better covenant? Do you want worse promises or do you want better promises? If you want a worse covenant or, or if you want a worse promises, then you should be a Torah keeper. Because that's exactly what you meant. But we see that there was a reformation, there was a necessity of change, and that Jesus came uh, and He affected it. Paul says this to the, the Galatians. But now, in, in Galatians 4.9, but now, after, the, after that ye have known God, or rather known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? You see, the walking in, uh, under the law or trying to live according to the Torah, brothers and sisters, we do not have a clue how heavy a burden that was. I mean, like I said, 613 ordinances, you misstep, you miss one, bam, you're guilty of all. You're guilty of all of it. And, and it was, in, in a way of speaking, it was bondage. And that's what Paul calls it. Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage to the works of the law. In Galatians 5 4, he says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Christ is no effect. If you think you're justified by keeping the Torah, He says Christ is no effect to you. He says you are fallen from grace. Now, very quickly you'll hear me say, this is not talking about eternity. This is talking about end time, in the kingdom of God, in the church. You cannot fall from grace from an eternal standpoint. But you can't. People stop believing in grace. People buy into this. Oh, I've got to. I've got to be a Torah keeper. 
I've got to start calling him Yeshua. Uh, and, you know, how, are you impressed with that? When, when you hear that, are you impressed when you hear people say that? I've got to start doing this. You see, they put themselves back under the law. But Christ, again, for the third time, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ, Jesus Christ is our righteousness. He is our all in all and our everything. If we could have kept the law, there was no need for Him to come. No, you can't fall from grace from an eternal standpoint, from, but from a temporal uh, uh, aspect of belief. I've known people that believed in grace and have left and they've gone to other orders. I'm not consigning them to hell. I don't have the right to do that. You don't either. Nobody does. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, Christ has become no effect unto you Torah keepers. If you think that you've got to keep the Torah in order to please God, uh, then you've missed it. Because the Scripture very plainly says, without faith it is impossible to please Him. And he that cometh to Him must believe that He is, and He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. And that's what we're told to seek. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. His righteousness. And you can't seek His righteousness till you come to an understanding that you have none of your own. But if you think that you're being righteous by keeping the Torah, you're, you're sadly mistaken. And if you ever believed in grace, you've fallen from grace from a temporal standpoint. Uh, now, what, what is the importance of the name of Jesus? Let's think about that for a minute. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. This question is asked, and it's a prophecy, by the way, it's a prophecy. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who hath ascended up to heaven, or descended? Now, we know that there's... We know that Elijah and Enoch... Enoch was taken... For he walked with God and God took him. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, right? There's a difference. You cannot say that they ascended or descended. Any Bible scholar will tell you that the word to ascend means to go in one's own power. And there's only one that has gone in his own power, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. When he ascended uh, 40 days after his resurrection, He's the only one that has ascended. And by the way, he's at he's Jacob's ladder that Jacob saw. The angels of God ascending and descending upon the on who the Son of Man on Jesus Christ. John chapter one will will uh, corroborate that. But Jesus Christ is Jacob's ladder. He is the only one that's ascended and descended in His own power. He says, "Who hath gathered the wind in His fist?" Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? We know that the Scripture tells us that God created all things by Jesus Christ. Right? He says, What is His name? And what is His Son's name, if thou canst tell? Well, that's a prophecy. That's a prophecy. We know now. We know. We have better understanding uh, of the Scripture. Now, if I haven't mentioned already, I don't think I have, I want to back up and tell you that I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. I already told you that the Old Testament, understanding Hebrew roots, is, is good, it's necessary to help us have an understanding, but it does, nowhere in the New Testament are we told that we're to submit ourselves uh, to, the, to the Torah or the, or the uh, works of the law in order to be righteous. To the contrary, we're told just the opposite of that. <clears throat> Matthew one twenty one, And thou shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And that's in all capitals there. I think that... Now, I do not believe that the King James is inspired of God. Okay? But I do, I do believe that it, what we have is a pure preserved copy. And yes, 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 there were there were no revisions, 
but there were corrections to printing mistakes and spelling errors. There was an update of the text type. Okay? But there were no revisions in the King James. There, and I hope that I explained that early on. But he says, Thou shalt call His name Jesus. That's His name. And, and it's important as we go on, we'll begin to see this. In Acts chapter 4, Verse 10, he says, 10 through 12, Be it known unto you, all ye people of Israel. Now, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Hebrews now. Listen up, Hebrews, all ye people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole, Talking, talking about the man at the beautiful gate. He says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now, pay a particular attention to verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. He says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, there's no name given, uh, no name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the only name that can save us, brothers and sisters. He didn't he didn't call him Yeshua, he called him Jesus. Philippians 2.9 says, Speaking of Christ, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him and given Him a name, which is what? Which is above every name. Wonder what that name is? Anybody know what that name is? He tells us that at the name of Jesus, every name, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. It's a highly exalted name above every name and the name is Jesus. It's not Yeshua. It's Jesus. You know, all these people are going to claim, oh no, no, that King James got all these kinds of errors and corruption and it's... Well, you, you know what you're saying? If you say that, you don't have a standard. If... If when God says in this book says that He'll preserve His word unto all generations, and He said that His word, you look in Proverbs 35 says His word is pure. If that doesn't exist, we're all in trouble. But we're not in trouble <laughs> because we do have a, a standard. It's pure, and it's been preserved to this very generation today. And it speaks the truth, and people don't like it because it speaks the truth, and they want to discredit it, credit it because it puts them in their place. It makes them responsible. You know that little responsibility thing that people like to kind of snake away from? This book puts you in your place, and that's the reason people don't like it. That's the reason they try to discredit it. <clears throat> I don't know how many of God's people have fallen for this uh, Hebrew game, this Hebrew roots. Uh, you've got to be a Torah keeper, keeper, and you've got to. If you say Jesus, you're you're actually calling on Zeus. And that's a bunch of hogwash. And I'll call it exactly what it is. His name is Jesus, and I'm not ashamed to call him Jesus. He's uh, uh, Jesus Christ, and he is God manifest in the flesh, and I'm not ashamed of it. And I believe that. Uh, anybody to, and there's people out there saying, "Oh well, you know the the New Testament was really written in Hebrew." Now, where where'd you get that? They're just pulling stuff out of thin air. No, it was written in Greek. Now, what the Septuagint, what you've got there is the Hebrew translated into Greek. But we had the New Testament was written in Greek. And it was translated by the King James translators out of the Texas Receptus into what we have today. And yes, I told you, spelling corrections, when, when we're talking about one or three million one hundred and sixteen thousand plus letters, 
And you're laying those out one by one in a printing press, reverse, upside down. You're going you're gonna to make a mistake, but they've been corrected, okay? <laughs> they've been corrected. So well, that's what those, those people will try to call it. And when the text was changed, they oh, that's a revision. No, it's no different from, from changing from New uh, Baltic to Helvetica to Times New Romans to whatever font you use in Microsoft Word. There's no difference. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> and there were no additions, there were no deletions, and there, no, there were no changes. There were just spelling corrections. And like I told you that even though the, the, the modern English began around 1500, the vocabulary was settled, but the spelling had not settled down yet. And it, it was later, once, once the spelling had settled down, and, and we've got the spelling like we do today, then they went in and, they went in and updated the spelling. That's not a change. That's not a change. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying when I say that's not a change? I hope you do. <clears throat> now, when um, in Acts chapter 8, it says in verse 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So, when the disciples believed Philip concerning the things that he was preaching, and they believed on the name of Jesus, he says they were baptized, both men and women. That name is important. Acts chapter 9, verse 27 said, but, when, when, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, talking about Paul. Now there was a period of time that Paul had been out preaching and he, had, he, had not, he was yet to go up to Jerusalem to the other elders. But here he says in Acts chapter 9, verse 27, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how that he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now, that's how the preaching of the gospel, we're to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's how the preaching of the gospel is to be preached in the name of Jesus. By the way, did you ever notice that Paul's Hebrew name got changed to a Greek name? Saul is now Paul. You never see a change. Well, Jesus was Yeshua, now He's Jesus. No, He's always been Jesus. He's always been Jesus. Savior. Yeah, I know it's a title, but that's that's the name that He's designated for Himself to be called. We could go out... uh, There's hundreds of different names of God in in the Bible. We've got to actually have a, a poster back in... Uh, the fellowship hall on the wall. Look at it sometime. About all his all his different names. But when it comes to whether or not we call him Yeshua or Jesus, it's Jesus Christ. And uh, you want to be drug under the law. Uh, you want to be drug under that bus. That's your problem. I, I pray for God's people that get caught in that kind of stuff. And in First Corinthians chapter six, when Paul was talking about how that some of us lived in the past. How that we all did some ugly things by nature, right? In 1 Corinthians 6.11, he says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We find justification in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay? It's not Yeshua. It's Jesus. Luke chapter 10, and I'm just going to read through these, and I'm trying to reinforce over and over the importance of the name of Jesus Christ. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And they, they called him Jesus. The devils are sub. Did you know that? And, and the uh, the devils are subject. And, and he goes on to tell him. He says, "Rejoice not that the devils are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven." But we, uh, by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, can tell Satan to get behind us. 
But so oftentimes we don't. I don't understand why we don't. We have authority to cast Satan behind us. You ever hear Jesus say it? Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense. <laughs> there were some other, there were some other people that tried to do that too. Remember the vagabond Jews uh, uh, in Acts chapter 19? Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, here are some people that saw Paul casting out devils. And there are some vagabond Jews, maybe some of the baser sort, okay, as the Scripture may describe it. Some Hebrews over there that saw Paul. Look at Paul. He's casting out devils in the name of Jesus. Well, they thought they could do it too. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And you know what happens next? That spirit overcame those men. He beat them up and they ran out of the house naked (laughs) it didn't work for them because they weren't in the right spirit but they tried they tried to invoke the name of Jesus but they were doing it for the wrong wrong motivation for the wrong reasons so and the man remember the wild Gadarean when the Lord came to the tomb that man was it couldn't be bound with chains or fetters, but he, uh, he was. They said he was howling like a wild animal and all that. And, uh, when when Christ came to him in, in Mark chapter five verse seven, he says, and he cried with a loud voice and said, "What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not." Now, interesting thing. Do you notice a lot of times when the Lord approached somebody that was possessed with the devil, they, that devil knew exactly who he was. They knew who he was. I know who thou art. Thou art the Son of the Most High God. And they called him by name. And the Lord rebuked them and said, You hold your peace. You don't be telling anybody. You know, remember the Scripture in, in James where... Uh, where James says the devils also believe and they tremble, and that's where this this uh, evil spirit said, "You come to torment me before the time." He, he was trembling, and he knew that his days were numbered. But they knew who Jesus is. <clears throat> so, one last one in Acts chapter sixteen. And remember the woman that was following around Paul saying, these are the servants of the Most High God for for days, I think. And Paul was grieved in his spirit. And he says, she did this many days. And But Paul, being grieved, turned and, and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, there's a whole lot more evidence. I'm not will- Let me tell you something I'm not willing to do. I've admitted to you that this originally that the printing of this had some printing errors and had some spelling errors and was and the type was updated, but I'm not willing to admit that it has any errors. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I admit the first error, I might as well just chuck the whole thing aside and just go find a bar somewhere and drown my sorrows. But I'm not going to do it. I have people emailing me all the time, Brother Keith, don't you know that uh, oh, that word Easter over there in Acts chapter 12, uh, that, and that really shouldn't be there. Don't you know that? And I think they got it right, by the way. And they're talking, they're talking about the, the pagan observance of Easter, not Passover. I think the translators got it right. If if what this Bible tells me that it's pure and that it's preserved and that it, it is the inspired Word of God, and if I don't believe that and I don't have a standard, why do I even try? Why do you even try? If we don't have an absolute standard, I believe that we do have an absolute standard 
in this in this King James Bible that we have. Yeah, and I know, I admit that even uh, printers get in a hurry. I, I had bought a, uh, a King James Bible off the shelf probably eight or ten years ago, and one that I that I used to study out of. And I got over to uh, 1 Corinthians 11 or 12 where there should have been some red letters. And they were completely missing. Okay? That's the printers. So, I say a Cambridge or an Oxford edition are going to be the safest. If you get buy a King James Bible that's printed by Joe Bob's Printing Company, that may be your first clue that you want to pass it by. Because it may have some printing errors in it. It may have uh, it may have some some printing errors. I didn't say textual errors. I said printing errors. It's it happens even today. But the the the, the British are very proud of the King James Bible, and they take great care in making sure that the Cambridge and the Oxford edition. And by the way, those are the two places where the King James translators assembled. Where that team, where those teams assembled to translate to what we have today, that's where they assembled. But they take great pride to make sure that they get it right. But like I said, if you you go to pick up a King James Bible and you look in the front and it says this was printed by Joe Bob's Printing Company, you might want to pass it by. Get you a Cambridge or an Oxford. Uh, you, you know. There's a lot more that I could say about this. I probably already wore you out. But I, I just want you to understand that His name is Jesus Christ. The Bible was written in Greek. Don't anybody tell you the New Testament was written in, in Hebrew. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And, and there's some Aramaic in the book of Daniel and, and uh, some other places. Uh, a few chapters in the book of Daniel. Um, but... Don't let anybody tell you the New Testament was written in Hebrew because it was not. Don't let anybody let you tell you that you've got to keep the Torah in order to be justified or found righteous in the sight of God. Jesus Christ is your righteousness. Jesus Christ is your justification. His name is Jesus. And thou shalt call His name Jesus. And uh, if you... If you want to go back and look at the, the names of the Hebrew words, you'll probably find Yeshua over there. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's not the same thing that we're reading in the Greek. Had Jesus lived this day and time, you, the, the Bible pro- likely would have been written in English. Today, English is the universal language. Today, English is the universal business language. Uh, you, go, you go to China, and in, in school they teach one of the classes they're taught English. You know, just for a while, I remember going to school here. I had a, uh, I went to, when I was de- living down south in Houston for a while, I had a Spanish class. That made sense. We were close to, you know, a lot of, a lot of Hispanics down there might interact. But you go to a lot of countries around the world today, they're teaching English because English is the universal language. English is the universal business language. And had Jesus been alive today, the Bible would probably originally have been written in English. Like the New Testament was written in Greek. And what we have is a translation. It is not an interpretation. Um, it, and there have been no revisions, but there have been corrections. And I've explained those, what they were. About all the, the meticulous uh, duty of setting up all those pages to be printed on Gutenberg's printing press and the change of the type and the, the settling down of the spelling of modern English. And yes, we do speak modern English. I want you, if, even if, if you're not, don't have an interest in it, I hope you do, just uh, go to YouTube and type in Middle English and listen to it. And then you'll understand that we are speaking modern English today. And they were the King James was written, uh, translated in modern English. Um, but it's a poetic, more of a poetic language with the these and the vowels. You'll notice that even the, the, uh, the message of the King James translators that you find in the, in, the, in the front of most of your King James Bibles, they don't talk like, they, like you read in the, in the Bible itself. They, don't, they talk like you and I do. That tells you that God designed to have this book written in such a way that when you heard it, 
you had no doubt you were hearing the Word of God being spoken. That's that's what I see in it. Uh, but anyway, brothers and sisters, if you don't get anything out of what I've said today, I hope that you understand that His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's the Savior anointed, and His, his name is not Yeshua. You call Him Jesus. Thank you all for your good attention. As we stand and sing a suitable hymn, one or more have a desire to unite with this body, this will be your opportunity. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.